Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Yeah? Are you enjoying your songs? I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to come and speak to you guys because you're practitioners. Usually I talk to lawyers and doctors and uh, accountants and uh, it's very Jejun and boring. So, we're going to have fun today yeah? because we are the doers, man. We are the ones that correct the whole thing. Yeah? So we're going to do this. We're gonna, I'm going to tell you my pastor's story. And then uh, we're going to finish that pastor's story and then do some Q&A and sort of banter together and disagree and agree and fight a little bit yeah, in practice. And then, if you're lucky, I will teach you an African song at the end of the presentation. Yeah? yeah. That way you can take something back home. Okay? In 1979, my parents and I I walked to an incredible experience. We had gashes out of the apartment that we lived in, and my father looked out of the apartment and he saw a soldier wielding a AK-47. And in Swahili, in the Mago of Bantu language in Arabic, he said the following. Get out of your apartments right now. Get out. And he was so rude and so tough and brazen that my father said, let's get out of the apartment because if he comes into the apartment, he might actually kill us. So we get out of the apartment and we are hauled up to this roundabout station where we meet an incredible scene. And it turned out that they had run up the whole village. And as I walk into that scene, I see my playmates, Masko, Hassan, and Kukuli, with their parents and tears rolling down their faces. And I knew this was going to be a long, long day. So as we walk into that scene, there was a restaurant as big as this. And that same reprobate comes up with a bullhorn and he says to everybody, everybody simmer down, be quiet. And as we simmer down, he utters the most painful words I've ever had in my entire life. He says, last night, two of my soldiers were killed and I'm here to figure out who killed them. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a firing squad until you tell me who killed those two soldiers. A firing squad. We were aghast at this particular accusation because in any similar society, what happens when a crime like that is committed? You investigate the crime, you police the crime. He did not. He, the audacity for him was to come and just surround the whole village and that's a big question. So to no avail, he picked up four people at random. One, two, three, four. Come on. And as they bring those four up, he asked them a question again. Who killed those two soldiers? To no avail, again, he pulled out a magnum pistol and shot all four of them at once. <laughs> the cacophony that ensued after that, because now all of a sudden, we know we're in the middle of a firing squad. Mothers grabbing their kids, people screaming, and he yelled at again, everybody be quiet. Be quiet. We're going to do this all day until you tell me who killed those two soldiers. And as we simmer down again, he picks up another four. One, two, three, four, come up. And as he points at those four, neighbors have to point at each other saying, he picked you. Can you imagine right now, your neighbor pointing you out and saying, you are the one that they pointed out, knowing very well that you're going to be one, executed. It's amazing what human beings can do when they're caught between a rock and a hard place. We are all civil now, but when push comes to shove, it's amazing what you would do to save yourself and let the other person go. So the sport put up against their will, lined up, the person was asked again to know if those four gunshots rang out again. That was eight. Before I could bring up another four, a young man at the very back rose up his hand ever so gently and he yelled out, I did it. And we said, what? And we looked back to see who this young man was. And as it turns out, he was a visitor of the village, and there's no way he could have committed that crime. So they bring him to the front, and there's banter between the two of them, and I shut my eyes because I didn't want to see that again. And as they finished bantering, that gunshot rang out, and I could feel his body fall to the ground as he shook into his death at that very moment. At which point, this horrible human being had the audacity to tell us, thank you so much for your cooperation. I hope this never happens again. And if it does, I'll be back here and we'll do this again. I was 10 years old, watching adults do this. And at 10, 
when you see a firing squad so brazenly put before you like that, you start to, to think, uh, do adults really care about life? And do they understand the beauty of that godly thing called life? Or are they just doing their own thing? Because who does that? Who does that? And so, we go back home, and we let go, and my mother sat down with my dad, and my mother told my father, we are living in this country, because I cannot live in this country like this. And so, we begin our journey out of our country to become refugees in Kenya. So I want you to part that grotesque picture that I've just given you. And I'm going to walk you up back to who was there before that horrible day? So wake up out of the stupor, let's find out who Derek was. So I'm originally Uganda. Who knows where Uganda is? Really? I just asked that question in Santa Barbara recently, and the young lady said, I knew where Uganda is. I said, darling, where is Uganda? And she said, it is south of San Diego, closer to <laughs> Tijuana. <laughs> And I thought it was a joke, but she was really serious. Because <laughs> Americans, you can suck at geography, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Uganda is a small little uh, country. Let's see if I can bring it up here. There it is. Um, it's in the heart of Africa. It's the size of Oregon. Albeit with more people than Oregon. We have about 50 million people in that little country. But we are very proud of our country because we have a kind of, sort of a lot of things that we do that are fun. Number one is we are the source of the Nile. Okay? Now that is fantastic. If you don't know what that means, let me tell you what it means. There is no Egypt without the Nile. Okay? So all the Egyptian civilization begins in the journey of that river coming out of Lake Victoria, going up all the way to Egypt. In fact, we have an agreement with the Egyptian government never to divert the river away from them because if we do, guess what? They're done. So we're very grateful about that. Now, by the way, the Ethiopians also think they're the source of Nile because we have the Blue Nile and the White Nile. But they're not here to give the speech, yeah? <laughs> so we are the source of the Nile. We also find ourselves in another thing. Uh, we're great runners, am I right? We can run. I mean, good God. <laughs> Every time I see Americans running in the Boston Marathon, the <laughs> New York Marathon, and Chicago, I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to lose. <laughs> the Kenyans are here, the Ugandans are here. You guys can go to the moon, go. Leave the running to us. Thank you very much. We also pride ourselves in having the best pineapple in the world. However, the first time I saw an American pineapple, such as it is, it was so small. It was like, oh. <laughs> America, you can make a pineapple great again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you get that joke out of there again. <laughs> I'm not PC at all. <laughs> but we get this country back from the British in the 60s, get independence. And my parents are very eager to see us build a new country. And they were both teachers in the beginning, so they're ready to teach. You know, they're, they're, they're getting ready to teach. And then they realize that teaching doesn't pay very well. Now, I don't know, do teachers get paid well in the US? No. It's something that I don't understand that. Anyway, so they're not going to wait for us to become what? Uh, agreeable about that thing. They're going to change and morph into business people. So I saw my parents change from being teachers and learning new skills by themselves. My mother became a wedding gown seamstress. And I saw her every time she came back from, from teaching, spend the whole evening learning how to cut. Because that's what tailoring is all about. So I joke all the time that she didn't have Mannequins for flower girl dresses in the beginning. So guess who the mannequin was? Yeah. Moi. Yeah. This is why I dress better than any American man. <laughs> I, I have a bad joke about this. My son hates this joke. Um, 
I said to him, his name is Kevin, I said, Kevin, uh, do you know I was a Chris Dresser since I was five? <laughs> and he says, Dad, don't say that, I'm in college now. I said, Why? She said, you're embarrassing me. I said, touche, you embarrass me all the time. <laughs> My father, on the other hand, loved how to make soap. We're going to talk about soap here in a minute. And they did very well. My mom built the second largest David's bridal in the country and became a very wealthy woman. My dad built a big plant, I mean, soap making plant, and became a, 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 just a wonderful product guy. And that's how I learned how to make soap. And then guess who came into power then? Idi and me. And this whole promise of this wonderful country that was germinating immediately died. And so that particular um, situation we just backed over here happened and they lost everything. So going from private schools and doing all this wonderful stuff, being chauffeured to school and everything, I then ended up becoming a refugee. That is crazy. But before we do that, New part of the speech. Do you guys want to see my parents? Yes. yes. Let me show you my parents. That's you guys at River Nile. That's me. Wow. That's my mom and dad. I bring them up because uh, we, we need to understand the value of parents and how wonderful it is to have a own parent. And I'm telling you, not all of us have that opportunity. And some of us who have parents take them for granted. But I'll tell you something very magical about African parents. We don't have books like you guys do, you know, that, that are uh, self-help books, yeah? Seven Habits of What? Highly Effective People. Five Ways of Doing That. Two Ways of This. And none of that. And, you know, uh, you know passion-driven life. And we don't have those books. But what we have is a parent who sits down with you and really nurtures you and teaches you these value systems that help you sort of walk into these scenarios of challenge with grace. And so for what I'm going to show you today and how I build the Global Soul Project, it comes and emanates from the value system these two people have. Seeing them innovate all the time was amazing because my dad, after we lost everything, becomes a gorilla or a rebel uh, fighter and fights Idi Amin. And guess what skill he taught himself after that? He became a very good spy. My father was a spy for 15 years. And guess who they were looking for in that scenario? Him. Now, we don't know whether he killed the two soldiers, but there was something that there was a spy on that village. But he ended up becoming very, very important in our country, and he's actually a legacy driven man. My mom then goes on to become a feminist kind of lady back at home and starts to elevate the values of women in our leadership. So my dad puts me in Kenya, and goes back to fight Idi Amin, and puts me in the hands of an American woman from Pittsburgh to raise me. Now, how many of you have ever met Americans before? <laughs> Good. American women from Pittsburgh. They're crazy. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. She was so loud and obnoxious and very vicious. So the first day I meet Marge Campbell in her living room, she busts in and says, What's up, Derek? And they go, Oh, thank God. Because <laughs> I was in British space, yeah? And the Brits are very much what? Hello, darling, how are you? <laughs> So she says, would you care for a cup of tea? I said, that would be lovely. So she runs back into the kitchen, gets a cup of tea, and comes back with a cup of tea. I take a sip of it, and it was cold. Faux pas. <laughs> so I sit it back down, and she, she does what American women from Pittsburgh would do, which is, <laughs> what is wrong? I said, darling, I think you forgot to cook the tea. <laughs> she says, no, young man, that's American what? I see. I said, oh God. <laughs> you still forgot to cook it. <laughs> and that began our friendship. Then she says to me, Derek, you have to go to university. It's time for you to go to school. So I come to the US um, and land in the city of brotherly love. 
beautiful city, Philadelphia. My God, I landed into the city and I walk into my hotel. This is my first time to be in a, in a big hotel, you know, like a real, real hotel. So I walk into my room and it's copacetic. Lovely pillowcases, you know, everything. So I'm like, whoa, this is fantastic. I'm in the, I'm in the US, man, I, I made it. So I walk into the bathroom and in the bathroom, as I walk in, I see three bars of soap. Facial soap, body soap, and hand washing soap. Right. What's the difference? There is none. None. Now you see, that's why I have to talk to you guys because when I talk to lawyers, they say, "Come on, size none." <laughs> it is. This is the joke about this. So I figured, you know, my dad made soap. He never said, "Derek, that is your bad soap. Do not use it to your face." <laughs> Why do you guys have facial soap, body soap, and hand washing soap, and shampoo? And what is that? So anyway, I said, you know what? It's Americans being bougie. <laughs> so I'm going to take my two bars, put them in the back for another day. And I'll be fine. So I put the two bars, the two bars in my bag. I come back that evening, and what do you think they've done? They replaced it. But I'm a former refugee, what am I going to do? Steal the heck out of it. <laughs> Boom. So for three days, I was stealing soap. Then I realized, these guys are going to charge me for the soap. I don't have the wit to do it, so I took all the stolen stuff down to the concierge, as Laura Dan mentioned, and I, the concierge was African American. I have never met African Americans in my entire life. The only experience I had with African Americans was through the movie Coming to America with Eddie Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> So, I was dying to be an African American because, you know, I, my goodness, they're so cool. You know, even the men, especially the African American men, they're so cool. I mean, who walks like this? I mean, just think about it. African American men walking. <laughs> who walks like that? So, I was dying to meet these guys, and I wanted to say that famous word, yo, what's up, brother? <laughs> I wanted to say that so bad. So he's elegant, he's concierge, and he's out there. So I walk up to him and I say, What's up, brother? He said, What's up, young man? I said, Well, I have a secret for you. He said, Check out. He said, I've been stealing your soap. <laughs> he's like, What? Like from housekeeping? I said, No, no, you keep on bringing me soap every night. I can't afford it. Take it back to them. Tell them to charge me for it. He burst out laughing. He said, Are you African? Are you Nigerian? Because you guys think we're all Nigerians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Africa. Nigerian, no! We have 55 countries in Africa, okay? We're not all Nigerians. <laughs> so we are bantering, he's teasing me and I'm teasing him back. And he says, no, Derek, that soap is already charged into your room. So you're, you're fine, you're already, it's already built in. I said, okay. So as I walk away from him, a thought comes to mind. What happens to the partially used bar that you use once? What do you do with that? He says, oh, I mean, come on, dude. We throw that out. In fact, if you break the seal, even if you didn't use it, we have to do what? Throw it out. I said, this hotel or every hotel in the US? He says, every hotel in the US, once you open the thing of the seal, boom, out. My goodness, I went back to my room. And I sat down and I thought to myself, how much soap are they throwing away? How big is this country? And I'm going to bring up the number to you this afternoon. And I want you to imagine the number of how much soap do you think American hotels throw away annually? And let's see whether it comports with the number that you have in your mind. So, there's the number. 800 million bars of soap are thrown away every year. That is 2.6 million bars of soap every single day into your environment, into your landfills. Dangerous because it stops the biodegradable processes of your landfills. That is a lot of volume. And it goes into your water and you start to complain about all these elements that you face when you drink your water. So rather than complain when I look at that number, I remember that when my dad was letting me come to the States, he said, do you know what America is? So what is America, Dad? He says, there, it's, a, it's an, an, an incredible experiment 
of all these people who have come from all over the world to try and figure out how to live together and really do some impressive things. So how old, how old is your country? How old do you think your country is? Anybody? 200 plus, close to 300 years now. But can you imagine what you've done in 300 years? Look at it. It is absolutely, if you step back, because you guys are internally thinking this is horrible, but if you step back and look at the country, it is amazing what you have done. And you know why you've done that? Because you're one of the most diverse communities in the world. New York City speaks 91 languages. 91 languages in New York City. And that means that there's 91 what, cultures that have come from all over the world to build that particular city. So it is amazing that when you see that number, you can either come here and complain, or you can look at that number and say, America is a place for what? Construction. You come from Uganda, like I did, and you come here, you can complain all you want, but if you want to, go back to Uganda. But if you want to really make something of this country, stay here and solve that problem. Solve the problem. And so rather than complain, I just figured I'm going to solve the problem. So let's solve the problem. Okay? So that's my hotel room. That's what the soap looks like. It's a royal mess. Question. What do you think I did to kill the germs on that soap without altering the chemistry of the soap? That was the question. So you want to take a tab on that? What do you think I did? Microwave. Microwave. <laughs> really, dude? 800 million bars of soap. That's a big microwave. Good idea, but no. Because it still would change the chemistry of the soap. What else do you think I did? Wash them. Why is that wrong but right? Who's the liar? That's dirty. Okay. Good try. But the problem is that there are other sciences that come into that particular solution that would prohibit you from doing that. And one of the sciences is what? Accounting. So when you wash the soap, what in accounting are you using up a lot of? Water. Utility of water. That bill is going to be what? Way high, making the soap cost prohibitive. Did you freeze it? Freeze it? Well, that's a good idea. But what happens to germs when you freeze them and then you warm it up back again? They go to sleep. There are germs in Siberia that have been asleep for a billion years. And now with global warming, they're waking up and they're like, oh, okay, we're back. Good idea, but no. One more. We're going to try. UV light. UV light. No. <laughs> Thank you. So this is where you guys have to start to think about how we solve problems. There's what they call the power of observation. That as you look at a problem, you're constantly thinking of ways to solve it by observing other things. So one day, as I'm thinking about the problem, I watch, I'm watching telly, and a a, a, a commercial comes on telly of a, a guy who had invented this very interesting contraption. You put the meat into the plastic bag, okay, and do what? Yes. Suck the air out and create what? Yes. A vacuum. And guess what happens to the germs? They love to breathe like you and dust the macarena and eat you. But if there's no air, they die. And they die a natural death that does not interrupt the chemistry processes of what? The soap. Man, I jumped out of my bed, ran downstairs, looked at that soap, I said, oh my goodness, wait, want the contraption, put the soap in there, waited for two weeks for good measure, then took the soap to the lab, and they were testing for 12 pathogens. The lab calls me a week later and says, Derek, can you come in? They go, oh God, I think I failed. <laughs> so they said to me, what did you do to kill all the germs without altering the chemistry of the soap. I said, are they all dead? They said, yes. I said, if you give me the permission to go commercial with this, I will tell you the secret. Because 
People had tried to do psychosoba and failed for a long time. So guess what? I got the permission to recycle so. I know what you guys are thinking. Because the Americans, you're so bougie. You're like, you're like my son. My son was born here. He said, Dad, I could never use that soap. Really? Yeah. Because he doesn't know that actually that soap has 99% cleanliness. In fact, as clean as brand new soap from Prost and Gamble. That's how clean that soap was. But how do you get rid of the yak factor? Because all of us in our professions, in your work, you all have a yak factor. You run into things that are yaki. And we have to solve for those things. So, here's the first process. Peeling. Yeah, the first layer you talked about. We peel it. Then we get into the inside layer. And then we crush it. Okay, into a powder. Industrial plastic bag. We suck the air out of that bag. Zip lock it and that kind of thing. And then, after we do that, we awaken the soap. There it is. That's my little contraption. Thank you, Mom Nemo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by awakening the soap, I mean it was so dry that for it to be, cooked, to be brought back into a bar, you have to add a little bit of what? Moisture. Very good. And that creates a fidelity to kind of texture thing. Then you put it back into the machine, and as you extrude the, the soap out and force it together, you get this. That's University of Michigan students that came to volunteer with us. That's one day of work that they did. Unbelievable. So that was all went to the what? The landfills. Now it's brand new soap and it's really fantastic. So then we cut it into small bars uh, for you know six arms kind of thing, and then we're ready to do fashion. Now I'm just kidding. That one box, okay, has 161 bars of soap in it. And if you give it to a family of four, it lasts for a whole year. Because when you're teaching health and cleanliness, you can't give somebody one bar of soap and then walk away. And I'm giving this soap away to very, very important communities. In Malawi, for example, where we're going to look at in a minute, um, girls drop out of school because boys make fun of them because of poor hygiene. A bar of soap brought those girls back into school. So it's amazing. I started off by just solving an environmental problem. But now we're getting into education, we're getting into health. It's amazing how our work has this vicarious impact. And so here we are. This is a, 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 a 40 foot container. And it's going to, at this time, it was going to Liberia. What disease was going on in Liberia? Ebola. And the way to fight Ebola is to wash your hands. And I find my work so relevant because after Ebola came, came what COVID, the first line of defense against COVID is what? Wash your hands. Okay? So we are going to go to Malawi. And there's the so um, there are my wonderful, you know, um, <laughs> this is a bad joke, but I'll tell it anyway. <laughs> What do, what do American mamas say when you give them a gift? What do you guys say? You shouldn't have? Okay? Thank you. Have you ever seen an African mama say thank you before? Can I show you? And they ululate, yeah? And if you're lucky, they give you their daughter to marry. I have like 5,000 wives. There they are. I told that joke in Utah, I did not go very well. <laughs> Utah is like the most African state in the Union. So fantastic. They love me there too. They call me every year. Come back again. But I bring up this photograph because you guys are used to looking at African kids in dire straits. Because NGOs in the US use these horrible pictures of African kids with flies on them to raise money, to, to shock you guys so much that you say, oh my goodness, we have to give them $20 a month to educate their child, as if that's enough. But when you bring dignity to people, as you know very well, this is what 
people look like when you bring a little bit of heaven in their lives. This is so important because these girls now can laugh and smile and they're colorful. They had not dropped out of school. And they're back because of a bow of soap. The impact and the legacy of that is that some of them now are going to university. That's the impact and the legacy. Um, girls love soap. Boys do not. That's why in my tradition, we say, when a boy wants to shake your hand, you say, thank you very much, don't touch me, bloody bastard, don't touch me. <laughs> Namaste. Because if you wash your hands, then you don't transfer what? Germs. But once you don't wash your hands, then the germs happen. And because that is important to us, Africans, for the most part, we don't like to use forks and knives because we want to do it. Touch the food and eat the food with our hands and enjoy it that way. But in there lies the problem because then, if you didn't wash your hands, you get waterborne diseases and all the other diseases. So, here is this lovely girl um, who I would love to bring up. Uh, a young woman from this state in Alabama partnered with me and went and built an orphanage. She was 18 years old. Picked up herself, went to Kenya, built an orphanage for these young girls. And she lost her life while in Kenya to malaria. Something she had gone to fight showed her a different route. But her legacy for me has always been that every time I see that young girl, that little orphan, and that vow, so I remember her, her work. So every time you guys influence these young kids or these young people that you're working with, know that there's a legacy behind that you're living. That is so important to me. And so, if you're lucky, they give you a child to take home. <laughs> but this photograph comes up because, uh, before we get to Kia here, it comes up because if you do some remarkable work, you'll always have people following you. If you have no people following you at all, that means you're not being, being impactful. And that's what you guys have to be so proud of. That behind you are all those people that you are impacting and giving a, a good life uh, to them. That's us eating our food. And these kids are asking me a lot about the United States and what you guys do here, what's going on. Let me close with showing you that's where we are now um, in those countries. I came to give you a message um, of import because people ask me all the time, Derek, how did you get to do all of this? You're, you're new to the country, what, what got you to do this? And my father and I were talking and my father says every human being should have their self motto. What is your motto? What is your, 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 your how do you, what do you believe in that is originally yours? Not you quoting Shakespeare or Plato or anybody. What do you have that is brand new that you can actually give to yourself? And for me, I chose self. And self for me is an acronym that means this. That I believe so much in service. That uh, the reason I love service is because Americans are, are service communities. I saw Kwana Club people here. Uh, I, I, I love that whole notion of volunteering and giving back. Why is that important? Because volunteers and people who serve actually become very educated on the needs of the community. They become street people who can actually give back to the community in ways that are meaningful. Service is so important for education. Why? Because if you're educated about stuff that the community needs, then it's easy for you to do what? To lead. I know some people who think they're leaders, but they suck. Why? Because they don't serve. They think they can just waltz in and just talk to them do their own thing. Service education leads to leadership. And why is that important? Because then you can have faith in your service, in your leadership. It's hard to, 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 to have faith in a leader, you see them all the time here, yeah? that are self-absorbed, they are politicians, they are our churches, they, 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 they don't care about us. 
They care about their next point. Stop. Leaders are really supposed to be servants. Serving is important. Serving leadership is important. So that became my acronym. And I'm going to end here with a, a quote that I brought for you guys to take home. Um, don't, when you're talking about perfection, don't seek perfection. None of us are perfect. Now, some of you are not perfect. But it's not what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do here is seek balance. Especially for you guys who are in the service industry of giving back to the community. We as, as servers and leaders have to be balanced. Emotionally, physically. Be healthy. Because if you overwork yourself, then you won't be effective. If you don't understand balance, it's very, very dangerous because then you're all over the place. Be balanced. Justice. Seek justice. In everything you do, seek justice. In fact, our kingdom in Uganda, the king always asks one question. If you brought an idea to the king, the first thing the king asked you was, what is the injury of that idea? I know it's a beautiful idea, but what is the injury of that idea? And if the injury outweighed the benefit, he would not touch it. However brilliant it was. Because it would then upset the ecosystem of our community. And we live within our ecosystem in balance. Nobody consumes more than they can afford. And nobody is broke and poor like that. So we all are balanced. Justice. Then lastly, don't forget to have passion. As you can tell, I'm very passionate. Sometimes we forget to be passionate about our work because it becomes jejun. Guys, find a way to spend what we call a self-retreat. Your own day or your own week where you go away and rejuvenate yourself and gain back the but Go back and say, why was I involved in this? Why did I begin this whole thing? Have that passion. Go back and put a pause on everything and go back and rejuvenate yourself and come back with a big smile. Because my goodness, sometimes we become so groggy and everybody's looking at you going, oh, he's not on top of his game. Mm -hmm. Passion. And then, if you do that, humanity, in my view, would have meaning. I want to tell you that my job here today was to bring you that passion and to remind you of how important you are to us and to our communities. When you go back home, remember that you have to be able to innovate, create, and build with passion, with justice, and with meaning of balance in mind. And I can guarantee you, your legacy will be sealed. That's where the real wealth is in your legacy. Thank you very much.